Markets continue to climb higher in the week of the RNC. 30 minutes until the start of trading. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Basak. And I'm Katie Greifeld. Bloomberg Open Interest starts right now. Kicking you off with U.S. retail sales, excluding autos, rose in June by the most in three months, suggesting consumer resilient spending at the end of the second quarter. And earnings season ramps up with financials firmly in focus. Bank America trading tops while Morgan Stanley's wealth unit lags. And Silicon Valley cheers Trump's VP pick. The former president taps Ohio senator and ex-venture capitalist J.D. Vance as his running mates. Let's take a look at where markets are trading right now. And uh, we're looking at a rally, of course, after retail sales, as Shanali mentioned, stronger than expected, flat, but not a decline. The S&P 500 up about two tenths of a percent in the pre-market. Same too, if you take a look at big tech. Meanwhile, the treasury market, you can see yields actually uh, down a little bit right now, about two basis points, but that 10-year camped out at about 4.2%, Matt. All right, taking a look at what's happening in terms of retail sales. Here you can see um, the BN survey uh, was for a drop, but we actually had a beat there. So better news for the consumer. What does that say about the Fed? I'm also keeping an eye, of course, on those bank shares, watching Bank of America beating on trading and net interest income up about eight tenths of one percent pre-market. But Morgan Stanley missing on wealth management revenue, bringing it down almost three point six percent pre-market. Schwab also dropping more than seven percent pre-market after reporting that fewer clients open brokerage accounts than expected, Matt. All right, we are getting breaking news. The IMF just releasing its World Economic Outlook, warning about the risk to global growth from interest rates staying higher for even longer. Um, if you take a look at uh, the actual headlines here, you can see that the IMF um, expects global GDP growth in 2024 this year to be unchanged at 3.2 percent. It raises uh, 2025 world GDP growth estimate um, from 3.2 percent to 3.3 percent. So little change changes there, but the, the real warning is that the slowing disinflation risks really uh, among higher rates. Yeah, it's interesting, of course. This comes as we've heard from Chairman Powell just yesterday saying that this recent data that we've gotten on inflation, on the economy, it adds somewhat to his confidence that the Fed is going to be able to embark on a rate cutting cycle sooner rather than later. But still, to get this IMF warning, uh, the timing is very interesting here. And certainly against the bond market, you are seeing that bid across the curve today after those retail sales. We have the ECB just days away as well. Let's see if we can get rates lower across the world as fast as traders I do want. feel like my my chair's a little bit high here. You know what? I'm Maybe you're just a lot taller than Matthew Matthew Miller. Miller. To your level there. I don't know what was going on. I let's, got shunted today. Let's get out to uh, Mike McKee right now, our chief economics and policy correspondent. Um, he's got a deeper look into uh, the IMF and retail sales, really. Mike? Well, Matt, retail sales were better than expected, even though they come in flat for the month. As you mentioned, there was an expectation of a three-tenths decline for the month. But the real problem uh, was, as economists thought, automobiles, because the uh, outage in the computer systems for many auto dealers in June ha hampered sales. And so we saw auto sales down uh, on the month by uh, 2%. And that uh, is the biggest uh, mover that subtracted from real growth. But auto sales don't go into the core as uh, does gasoline and uh, building materials. And so core was up a strong nine tenths of a percent. That's really good news overall for the economy. It shows consumers may be taking a, a little breather, but they are not falling off the edge. And so the Fed uh, can, uh, if they want to, at least in private, talk about a soft landing. We also saw strengths in department stores and non-store retailers were up 1.9%. Now that we're in the middle of prime days, we'll probably see that number go up for uh, the month of July. So all in all, good news. Uh, the import price index also flat on the month. So inflation showing some signs definitely of slowing down. And that's important because the retail sales numbers are not adjusted for inflation. And they had gotten a boost not only from the pandemic payments people got, but from inflation because they're measured in dollar values. But what we see here is that 
that inflation has come down and retail sales are holding up even without that boost from inflation and that has to cheer the Fed. You look at what uh, the markets are thinking right now and basically they've repriced in September as a rate cut. Remember yesterday after Jay Powell, they took it out. Uh, it's back now and probably going to stay given the way the economic data are going. All right, Mike, thanks very much. Michael McKee there talking to us about retail sales. Joining us now is Cameron Dawson, Chief Investment Officer at New Edge Wealth. Cameron, it's interesting, um, as Shanali points out, the timing of the IMF warning on inflation, it doesn't really help Jay Powell if he wants to cut rates sooner than later. Yeah, and I think it's really also interesting in the context of Bank of America's earnings this morning. They talked about how some of these loans that were done in 2020 and 21 are now starting to reprice higher at higher levels. So this idea that higher for long is finally going to have an impact on the economy and weigh on economic activity. And we think that that is something to watch as we go into 2025. But let's talk about the U.S. because I, I hear what you're saying uh, when it comes to the higher for longer. But you take a look at today's data and, of course, the market reaction. Retail sales, they were flat but better than expected. It feels like it's sort of this best of both worlds where that's not going to shift the odds of September. But it, it's not like the consumer is really deteriorating. Yeah, here. true Goldilocks. We can have it all, meaning that you can have this deceleration in inflation. It's not showing up in higher prices, even though we are getting higher demand. And this idea that we still have an underlying strength and resilience of the U.S. economy. It does not mean that there aren't signs of fraying. You also heard that from the banks, that there is a bifurcated consumer, but that bifurcated consumer isn't pulling down the aggregate data yet. When you look at WIRP Go on the terminal, this mm -hmm. is the world interest rate probabilities, you see traders starting to bake in not only a sure thing for September, but closer to three cuts yeah. this year now. And when you think about what you were saying about that lagged effect, about mm -hmm. banks now, just now, <laughs> passing on those higher interest rates at a greater rate to consumers, do you think we need those three rate cuts, or do you think it's even achievable? It's a really good question because if we do three rate cuts, does that signal urgency by the Fed? If they're cutting every single meeting, is that because they have to? Does it mean that they're seeing something that we're not seeing? I think that the data today, retail sales holding up, even though inflation's coming down, it warrants having letting them have patience because it just leaves the door open for them to do what they want to do in 2025 versus having to continue with this every single meeting cadence. Will they be able to cut in 2025 if Donald Trump Trump is elected and we get 60% tariffs on China's Chinese goods across the board. I mean, everyone has come out and said that would be very inflationary. Talk about a wild card. The thing about the inflationary dynamic of tariffs is we have to offset it by the fact that it typically weighs on demand. So meaning tariffs kind of act like a tax. You see demand turn lower. If you look at the inflation data from 2017 through 2019 when tariffs were being enacted in his last presidency, what you saw is that durable goods inflation did turn higher. But it was all offset by falling gasoline prices and the fact that non-durable goods inflation turned lower. So I agree that that would be the big wild card. Card. If you slap big tariffs on goods, could we see that durable goods prices start to really move higher? How do you handle a wild card? Is that <laughs> something that you hedge for? And if so, do you hedge for it now? Or what does the timing possibly also, look how like? how wild is it? I mean, it's starting to look like not very wild at all, right? Yeah, it, meaning that it, it could start to get priced in. And maybe the, the observation is that it's getting priced in more in international markets at this point than maybe in U.S. markets. And I think it's a question of how much can companies pass through increased input costs into consumers. One of the interesting things that we've been seeing is that a lot of input costs still are going up. Things like shipping costs are skyrocketing. But durable goods prices aren't moving. This tells you that companies are losing pricing power. And so in a world where consumers really are getting stretched, how much more increase in prices can they take? Cameron, I'm going to resist the temptation to talk about the topic du jour and bank earnings season and earnings season more generally because we're going to get very quickly into tech earnings. And you have the overlay of the election cycle mm -hmm. and Trump picking a running mate here in a person who demanded a breakup of Google <laughs> at one point. So how much risk is there to big tech heading into next year? 
I think that the thing that keeps tech continuing to be propelling is these semi-monopolies, this incredible earnings power, incredible return on invested capital. There have been pockets of times where there have been threats to that, but they've been so de minimis compared to their incredible earnings power that you simply haven't seen tech price in the question of could you see that earnings power get dented in the future. Maybe that's something that we start to see reflected in multiples. It remains to be seen if markets will want to price that in early if you're seeing no signs of regulation. But of course, that is, again, another wild card. How do you deal with all this political risk? I mean, we were talking about J.D. Vance this morning, and of course, he has um, been against social media, the censorship of conservative views. Uh, he's called for the breakup of Google, again, recently. Um, this isn't something that he said in the, only in the past. And um, now he's going to take, you know, or the the Trump PAC is going to take $45 million a month from Elon Musk. So, you know, it goes both ways, and I guess you have to really be deep in it. I think that the, there's two points. The first one is that markets do what they do in spite of or despite of what goes on in Washington. So if you look at the markets in aggregate, it pretty much is equal whether or not you get Republican or Democratic control. The other one is that markets tend to price in a lot prior to an election and don't necessarily follow through after it. Look at the industrials in 2016. You priced in this huge infrastructure, all these changes in spending, and they peaked on a relative basis two weeks after the, the 2016 election and have still never made a new relative high. So that's where we might price in a lot prior to the election, but it could be a buy the rumor, sell the news kind of situation. And I'm going to ask you about something other than politics, because we have to talk about what's going on with small caps and this rotation trade that we're seeing. The Russell 2000 index uh, up by more than 1% four days in a row. It's been quite a while since we've seen that. Is this sustainable? Do we actually have the corporate earnings power to back this up? That is the ultimate question. We think it's sustainable for at least the next month or two. Positioning is so very light. You saw a lot of ETF outflows that there's a snapback trade just because of that. But then it comes down to earnings. And earnings will be the driver as to whether or not this is a two-month or a two-year trade. Look at earnings expectations for small caps into 2025. They have earnings going from 3% this year to 36% next year. Wow. That means small caps have to deliver. And if they don't, you go into an earnings revision down cycle. The key reason why small caps have underperformed over the last two years is because earnings have been revised down by 25%. So if you're bullish, you say earnings growth is going to get a lot better for small caps. We can buy them. If you're bearish, you say that's a high bar. So our mantra right now is we're here for a good time, not for a long time. <laughs> we'll buy small caps, get this chase rally, then we'll re keep reassessing the EPS trajectory. Cameron, we thank you so much for joining us. That is Cameron Dawson of New Edge Wealth. We're going to take a quick check now on some of the other companies, finance companies, reporting this morning. Of course, we're taking a look at PNC Financial, guiding net interest income growth of negative 4% this year, and Schwab down more than 7.8% after new brokerage accounts missed estimates. State Street still, though, on the rise, recapping a few things also from Bank of America, which is well underway with their earnings. Remember, they increased their net interest income guidance here and interestingly enough they say that the benefit will be smaller sequentially in the first quarter of 2025 for that net interest income benefit it'll start rolling up into 2026 Matt all right we're going to talk more about uh, bank earnings and maybe um, mix a little politics in there as well because uh, JD Vance does uh, sit on the Senate Banking Committee and has partnered with Senator Elizabeth Warren in the past, which is, I think, absolutely fascinating. Stephen Bigger is going to join us, Argus Director of Financial Institutions Research. This is Bloomberg.
Sorry, Chanel, you can adjust it however you like. Hi, Stephen. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. No, Good I mean, here. I'll put mine down to match however you guys want yours. Hi, Stephen. Hello. Just a little bit lower. I liked it higher than before, but lower than before. Now to high interest, to look at what's making headlines around the world. Donald Trump made his first public appearance since the assassination attempt. He appeared at the RNC in Milwaukee as Republicans gathered to nominate him as their presidential candidate for the third time. Trump stood next to his VP pick, J.D. Vance, a 39-year-old senator from the great state of Ohio. Vance named China as the biggest threat to the U.S. in an interview with Fox News. President Biden labeled J.D. Vance as a clone of Donald Trump. The president's remarks were just one part of a full court press deployed by his campaign after Trump's selection was announced. Democrats seek to cast doubt on Vance's independence and populist credentials by painting the venture capitalist turned senator as both subservient to Trump and uh, the elite. Elon Musk is pledging to pour $45 million a month into a pro-Trump political action group. The planned cash infusion could help build Trump's fundraising advantage over President Biden. Palantir's Joe Lonsdale and crypto billionaires Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss are among other prominent donors to the PAC. And after firing tens of thousands of workers, Tesla is steadily adding employees back again. The company is looking to hire nearly 800 new employees. The positions range from AI specialists to more run-of-the-mill service jobs. The pickup in hiring has coincided with Tesla shares going up on a tear. Shanali? And more bank earnings out this morning. Bank of America said net interest income would climb by the end of the year. Meanwhile, Morgan Stanley's wealth management unit missed on analyst estimates here. Joining us now is Stephen Bigger, Director of Financial Institutions Research at Argus Research. And Stephen, you look at what had happened this morning, Morgan Stanley being among the most expensive of the pack from a price to book perspective here. How much room do they have to miss on a key metric like that? Well, yeah, missing is uh, never a good thing, obviously. Um, you know, the, the strength from capital markets is going to have to outweigh uh, a lot of that and some of the deposit pressures that they uh, they uh, talked about this morning in the release. So, yeah, I think it's, um, you know, these, these banks uh, broadly uh, have an improving backdrop uh, of, of capital markets uh, after, you know, two solid down years, uh, revenues now look uh, pretty promising. And we're seeing these, you know, big divergence, obviously, between the companies, 20 and 70 percent year over year gains in investment banking. So uh, I think the, you know, the improvement story uh, should be looked at in the, the vein of the, uh, the past two years and, and uh, relatively weak uh, comparisons, but still, uh, you know, clearly a better, much better backdrop for, uh, for investment banking now. How much of a tailwind could rate cuts start to provide some of these banks? You think about Bank of America finally guiding higher on net interest income mm -hmm. through the end of the year, but also telling uh, analysts now that the benefit will be smaller going into next year and taper off into 2026. How do, how do you handicap that? Well, it, at least it was good to see that the narrative has been unchanged since the guidance after the first quarter, that the second quarter would be the trough. So. We didn't expect an enormous rebound. If you go back to the beginning of the year, uh, most um, analysts had expected a uh, deeper rate cuts uh, this year. In fact, we you know would have already started, so we've not done that, uh, and therefore banks are still uh, facing some pressure from higher deposit costs. Um, you know, just not getting that net interest margin improvement, uh, nor the loan growth, which has been very anemic uh, again, thanks to higher interest rates. So. Uh, I, I think at this point, it's safe to say that the high rates have kind of overstayed uh, their welcome. Uh, banks would uh, would benefit from loan growth uh, and take some of the deposit pressures off if they moved a little bit lower. Uh, having said that, banks, of course, are very uh, interest sensitive vehicles, um, but they're also extremely well hedged, uh, and they can uh, survive a higher interest rate environment. Uh, the longer rates stay, uh, you know, high where they are. Uh, deposits will, re, will, will reprice, but so will the securities, uh, which have been underwater. Uh, so it's it's kind of a double-edged sword uh, for banks. But at this point, it does seem like lower rates would be would be much more beneficial now than than where they're at today.
I also want to talk about Charles Schwab, which reported this morning. And you take a look at net income, that beat estimates, earnings per share beat estimates as well. But the stock is down about 8% because you take a look at new brokerage accounts in the quarter, missing expectations. Again, a really uh, dramatic reaction in the stock, if you want to call it that. You have a buy rating on those shares. What do you make of this morning's results? Well, uh, yeah, Schwab is, uh, has typically grown their uh, pace of uh, accounts uh, at, a, at a faster rate. So uh, it is a bit, a bit worrisome. We'll be interested to hear what they, uh, what they say about that. Um, one, one thing that we have been, uh, you know, a bit concerned about uh, past the integration is that a lot of the customers that had accounts with both uh, Schwab and uh, TD Ameritrade or only with TD Ameritrade would you know, maybe move somewhere else. They had the opportunity to be with Schwab. Maybe they, they didn't want to go there, so they'll they'll take their account elsewhere. So I think that that could be uh, some of, some of what the uh, the weakness is there. Um, but you know, still a, a, a terrific franchise in terms of their uh, their margins. Uh, the deposits have uh, stabilized uh, from from a year or so ago. Uh, still a bit more expensive, but the outflows that we had uh, had been seeing uh, last March uh, have uh, certainly subsided. So, you know, we'll take a look at the uh, more of the commentary uh, that, that, that they have at, at this point. But I, I do think the, the future is still bright for Schwab. Stephen, how does how would a red sweep look to you? How would it look to the big banks? Because as we've been talking about, J.D. Vance, the new VP pick for Trump, has partnered with Elizabeth Warren on um, bills to end uh, or, or crack down on credit card swipe fees, um, legislation to end tax free um, uh, uh, mergers. And acquisitions. On the other hand, he's opposed, um, you know, bigger capital requirements that the Biden administration would like. So, what does it look like to you if Republicans take over? Yes. Well, that dynamic is uh, certainly strange bedfellows. I would say, um, a, a little, uh, not not way to expect. Uh, I think the uh, the prevailing narrative with uh, with the Trump win would be uh, that there would be a much easier regulatory environment. That uh, M and A activity would have a much uh, easier time of, of getting through. Uh, the Justice Department, the Federal Trade Commissions, et cetera. Um, and this may throw it in a, a, a little bit of a monkey wrench uh, to, to that uh, narrative, I would say. Uh, but, uh, you know, overall, I, I think uh, Trump will be the, the more dominant uh, voice here. There's probably things that uh, the J.D. Vance could do in the administration that would kind of ease some of those concerns and some of the, you know, the breakup talks of, of big tech and, and so forth. And it might be uh, watered down a bit. So. So I think I think the broad narrative uh, remains in place that uh, better for financials uh, under a uh, change in administration. All right, Stephen, got to leave it there. Really appreciate your time this morning. Our thanks to Stephen Bigger of Argus. And later today, we'll be speaking with Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan. That's at 2.30 p.m. New York time. This is Bloomberg. Moments away from the start of trading, this is Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. Right now, we're looking at futures that are pointing higher across the board. S&P futures up about a quarter percent. Uh, Russell 2000 futures up almost one full percent right now. On the New York Stock Exchange, we have uh, BUD, B-U-D is the ticker, ringing the bell with members of Team USA, um, celebrating the coming Olympics. Simply good uh, on the NASDAQ, celebrating, I think, seven years uh, since the IPO. And then in terms of stocks, we continue to rise again. Will we hit a 38th all-time high today? Katie Greifeld? All right, well, if you look at it right now, we're certainly on track to do that. The S&P 500 up three-tenths of a percent as those bells ring. The NASDAQ 100, too. But small caps obviously in focus right now. This would be a fifth straight day of gains, currently up about nine-tenths of a percent on the Russell 2000. But one stock we're keeping an eye on in specifics is Match Group. Climbing after Starboard Value became the third activist investor this year to take a stake. You take a look at shares right now, currently up almost 6% Shanali. Also, Katie, keeping an eye on those bank stocks heading into the open. Bank of America and Morgan Stanley moving in different directions. Bank of America up about 1.1, 1.2% after beating on net interest income. Morgan Stanley missing on wealth management down almost 2%. And remember, Schwab dropping the most, about 6.4%, 6.3% on the day, reporting that fewer clients opened brokerage accounts than expected. All right, and the Trump trade, losing steam. 
on day two, at least Trump media was. We had Palantir lower this morning, um, then it moved higher. Now it's lower in the cash trade. Let's get a closer look at Bloomberg's, uh, with, with Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abby, what do you see? Well, Matt, what goes up must come down. That is Newton's third law, equal and opposite reaction. Well, in the case of the Trump trade, it is opposite today, but it's not equal. You were mentioning that we have the shares of DJT lower down 9.7%. Palantir, it is actually uh, equal. But of course, yesterday, all of these Trump related stocks and sectors that could potentially do well uh, from policy changes if he is elected in November and of course after the assassination attempt and his fearless reaction that's how the markets were voting today though we do have a bit of a cooling for some of those stocks the stocks more associated with President Biden yesterday plunging now today they're higher what I would argue here though is we're seeing volatility if we take a look at DJT since it did start trading on the Nasdaq we can see lots of big moves most of these moves in fact are up one up more than one percent or down more than one percent today we're looking at the biggest day uh, since the company started traveling or trading I'm traveling backwards tra trading on the Nasdaq here you can see Doing the um, moonwalk Abby <laughs> I, I could do the moonwalk up uh, 31 percent yesterday today down but take a look at the 20 day moving average Katie that's a smooth that look still above it let's keep watching this trade I'm guessing we're gonna have lots of movement ahead Absolutely. Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. And sticking with politics, actually, we have some breaking news right now, and that is Andreessen Horowitz plan to donate to tr a Trump PAC. This is according to reporting from the information that Andreessen Horowitz stepping up to donate to a Trump PAC. Of course, we've seen Wall Street and a bunch of billionaires come out in support of former President Donald Trump campaign. We'll bring you more details as we have them. But let's take this conversation to the markets and welcome in now Marianne Bartels. She is Sanctuary Wealth Chief Investment Strategist. And uh, obviously politics is the topic du jour. So picking up on where Abigail left off, that you've seen a lot of the Trump trades kind of reverse from what we saw yesterday. When you think of some of the themes that have emerged in the run-up to that November election, are these investable themes or are these just trades? Well, Katie, we actually started saying since the debate between uh, Trump and Biden, uh, the market has already started to price in a Trump win. And I think that trade uh, continued with more momentum uh, after the events of the attempted assassination of, of Trump. So are some of these investables? Um, it depends on what pocket. You know, Financials are running on, on Trump, but also running on lower interest rates. I like bigger banks, not necessarily a bigger fan of regionals. I'm still concerned uh, about commercial real estate eventually hitting their balance sheets. Their balance sheets aren't as diversified um, as, as the bigger banks. You know, the market is looking for deregulation under Trump. Uh, but, you know, technology has been leading, and it's going to be a question as to whether or not uh, Trump will continue to be a fan or not a fan. He's actually doesn't like big industry in tech. So there's some concern in tech. But in general, markets trade on earnings. And we're right in the middle of second quarter earnings. We're looking for strong earnings in the second quarter, actually even going into the end of the year. So we think that the market is has momentum this summer. It's a, you know, a seasonal rally. Do you think we can get a pullback in, in the fall, but then another year-end rally? Yeah, I wonder about the potential for a rotation because um, our own Gina Martin-Adams at Bloomberg Intelligence has said that, you know, the S&P 493 are going to finally come out of this year-and-a-half-long earnings recession they've been in. Meanwhile, the Magnificent Seven, although earnings are going to grow there, aren't going to grow as much as they have been in the past few quarters. And as you mentioned, you know, under the Trump administration, the DOJ uh, opened investigations and sued Facebook, Apple, Alphabet, um, you know, and a, a number of these other Amazon, uh, big tech companies. So do you see a rotation that might not result in new all-time highs for the S&P? I still think we can hit new all-time highs, but it's a very good point. We started getting a rotation in the market on the CPI numbers last week, and the market's starting to price in that the Fed will cut interest rates in September. And the rotation I'm actually seeing is some weakness now in tech. I think technology and the stocks that, that have profited very well this year 
uh, are being used as a source of fun, funds to rotate into cyclicals and to some of those 493 stocks that um, have not performed. We're also getting a very strong rally in small cap. I, I'm still very skeptical whether or not small cap will take leadership. I still think this is a mega cap cycle, but they are being powered higher because hedge funds were very short. And I do think we're getting short covering and that's not completed yet. So on a tactical basis, I do think small cap do run. What I'd be paying attention to, to call a correction in this market are semiconductors. They've been the leaders of this whole market. They're starting to look tired. If you look at the technicals, they have not been able to break out to a new high. And if they don't, that's going to be a warning sign. And the same is true of the leader stock NVIDIA. So I'd really be watching those as early signals as to whether or not this market can correct in the fall. You know, it's interesting, even beyond the fall, you think about the risks, not just valuation risks, but any political, geopolitical risks as well, Marianne. I think back to J.D. Vance in one of his first interviews overnight here with Fox News, this idea of China being the biggest threat. What does that mean into a potential Trump administration for the semiconductor industry? Well, certainly Trump is not a fan of Ch China. He would be expected to lay on a, a number of tariffs. In the region, though, India should benefit. That, that would be a beneficiary if he really goes after um, China. In terms of technology, semiconductors, uh, you can't have AI without semiconductor chips. And I do believe that politicians will understand this and will allow semiconductors companies to blossom because without them, we don't have AI. And so, uh, interesting point there. You think about just sort of the geopolitical importance of semiconductors. Uh, maybe they'll s escape some, through some of that uh, focus that we've seen on tech. But when it comes to the AI theme, of course, like you said, we can't have AI without semiconductors. But if you follow that down, sort of to the downstream, where else can you follow that AI investable narrative to? You know, you can even find them in utilities um, because the power demand, not just from AI, but for um, EV, EV cars, for the blockchain. But some of the companies that have been in utilities that have been trading like growth stocks look like they could become a, a little bit toppy. Um, that's like a, a Vistra or a Constellation. You know, Software, parts of the software market have been a little bit weaker trying to figure out how companies are going to spend money on AI. But what I learned very early in my career is that there's a cycle to technology and it leads with semiconductors. You upgrade with hardware and some new old names that you're now hearing in that hardware space are Dell and Hewlett Packard. And then that also leads to software. So no matter what administration uh, wins this election, I do believe in AI. I do believe companies will continue to grow and benefit and have earnings, maybe not at the same pace, but I do believe tech will remain the leadership of this market. Our thanks to Marianne Bartels of Sanctuary Wealth. Thank you for joining us on, of course, a very complicated environment out there between the Fed rate outlook as well as the politics in the United States. I do want to bring you some headlines now from Morgan Stanley's analyst call currently underway. CEO Ted Pick, of course, his first year in the job, saying the bank is navigating geopolitics, the rate cycle, and the U.S. election. He says those are some of the key themes facing the sector down the road. He also says we're back in institutional equities, so playing up their historical strength there. Of course, as we know, stock is under pressure just a bit here as they missed on those wealth management revenues. But earlier, the CFO telling Bloomberg Sridhar Natarajan that 17% uh, returns on equity are nothing to cry about, guys. Coming up, the analyst action that you need to know this morning. That's up next in our top calls. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Open Interest. Quick check on where stocks are 14 minutes into the session. We are up, but not yet in a 38th record high. Uh, 56.50, the level on the S&P 500 right now, up a little more than a third of 1%. The NASDAQ uh, rising about the same. It's the small caps that are so interesting. The Russell 2000 up 1.5% as WERP, the World Interest Rate Possibility Screen on the Bloomberg Terminal, indicates we may now get three rate cuts this year from the Federal Reserve. And as a result, the small caps are rallying. Katie? All right, it's time now for Top Calls. Some of the analyst action in focus this morning. And first up, Evercore ISI downgrading Yum! Brands to inline and cutting its price target on the quick service franchise because of disappointment about Taco Bell trends. Next up, Morgan Stanley upgrading Sweet Green to Equal Weight. The firm sees the company's Infinite Kitchen as a positive catalyst. Now, the Infinite Kitchen is a system that robotically assembles salads. And finally, Piper Sandler downgrading Dollar Tree to neutral. The analyst says that the company is disadvantaged no matter who wins the White House. Trump's tariffs policies would probably cut profit margins. Meanwhile, Biden's proposal to expand overtime pay protections may hurt Dollar Tree's earnings, Shanali. And coming up, Katie, Blue Owl is pushing deeper into the private credit market with the deal to buy credit manager Adelia. Mark Lipschultz, Blue Owl Capital's co-CEO, joins us next for today's Wall Street Beat. This is Bloomberg. Blue Owl Capital, one of the fastest growing firms on Wall Street, pushing deeper now into the red hot private credit market. The company announcing that it will acquire credit manager Adelaya in a deal valued at roughly $800 million. The deal is today's focus of today's Wall Street beat. Joining us now with an exclusive interview is Mark Lipschultz, Blue Owl Capital co CEO and co founder. And it's interesting because this is your third acquisition in a matter of three months. So, why now and how much more? firepower do you have to do more deals, frankly, after this? Great to be here, and thank you, and, and particularly at this moment. Uh, the Adelaide investment is really a strategically critical one alongside, as you know, a couple of other critical transactions that we've completed, all of which together are about positioning Blue Owl to be the full service provider, full spectrum provider across the private credit marketplace. And that's really what Adelia is an extraordinary franchise, a couple decades old now, uh, in this now very focused market of alternative credit or asset backed credit. How big is that asset backed lending opportunity? Because everywhere we go across Wall Street, you see more and more private credit managers diving in. It's a very big market. And there's a lot of similarities to what private credit, private corporate credit, looked like just about 10 years ago when we started uh, Blue Owl, Owl Rock, uh, and, and a chance to really take an asset class. And we see the opportunity going forward in alternative credit to be analogous to and possibly bigger than the opportunity in corporate credit. The marketplace for asset-backed credit is about $7 trillion. So just mathematically, it is bigger than the syndicated loan market, if we think about that as a proxy for the marketplace for direct lending. So I think it is both a bigger market, and we're also at a time where investors have a greater appreciation and understanding for the benefits of investing in private credit solutions, which people have learned, I think, very well through the success investors have had over the last 10 years on the corporate credit side. Let's talk about the price tag. So you're paying $450 million up front. You're getting about $10 billion, a little bit more of that in AUM. How did you get comfortable with that, that 4 to 5% figure of AUM? So for us, in acquiring a business like this, just like in everything we do in our business, it's a bottoms-up calculation. So you know, at the end of the day, the measure you used, certainly, ultimately, a touch point. But for us, it's about the fundamentals. And we look at Adelia. Again, you know, this is a, a company, they're on their ninth flagship fund in alternative credit. Maybe a hot topic on Wall Street today. It's been a 20 year topic for Ivan Zinn and his partners. So we look and we see an opportunity both on the basic organic growth of Adelia, but also the combination. When you bring together the credit capabilities, including some asset backed capabilities we have at Blue Owl, marry them with Adelia. 
we see a tremendous amount of growth because we can deliver a product that will deliver great risk-adjusted returns for investors. So the fundamentals to us are appealing. I, I might hearken back, and this is something Bloomberg covered and reported on at the time when we acquired Oak Street. Uh, now, the real estate business in Blue Owl, actually very similar in size, had about mm -hmm. $10 billion in assets. Today, that business is approaching $30 billion in assets. Run, again, very similarly. Mark Zarr, a spectacular entrepreneur. We've become the market leader in triple net lease. We've now added a real estate finance capability in Prima. When we now complete the picture by adding Adelaya, we have the full range of credit capabilities to meet the moment. Let's talk about also uh, how many employees you're adding. Roughly 115, I believe. That brings your headcount to almost 1,000. With all these acquisitions that you're doing, all this onboarding, I mean, how do you maintain a cohesive culture? Such a spectacular question. Culture is monumentally important to us and monumentally important to the future of our business. We have these tenants that underpin everything we think about at the firm. And they're, it's a firm for us that's built around mutual respect. It's built around constructive dialogue, excellence, one team. These are themes we talk about a lot. Adelaide has that culture. Adelaide has a strong culture, a strong cohesive culture. The team's been together a long time, and they too are all about excellence. And they have skills on top of those cultural attributes that blend with us well. And we look at that actually first. We have to find a cultural blend before we can sort of get on to the, the business fit. But the cultural blend is there, and the business opportunity, their skills, they've got a data science team that really knows how to mine. It is a different adjacent business to corporate lending when you're dealing with the millions of data points available in consumer and commercial credit. Mm. So really going to be a powerful combination in our view. Uh, why are banks giving up so much business to alternative asset firms like yours? Why, why isn't Jamie Dimon saying, like, I'm taking this back? So I, I won't, I, I wouldn't uh, presume to speak for, for, for Jamie Dimon. I don't um, mean specifically No, Jamie no, no, Dimon. of course, I understand. But I, but I would say this. I think that much like corporate credit, it's not so much the banks you know, giving up as much as we're presenting a solution that's so fundamentally different for the user. Well, so if we think about any of these types of financings, when we talk about the bank market, it's a very transactional market. It's about... Look at its simplest form, a bank has one day assets that they're using for long dated lending, right? Deposits can be called any time. We saw that with Silicon Valley Bank. The heart of Blue Owl, the heart of private credit, is something as straightforward as this. Look, if you're going to make long term commitments of capital, then you ought to have long term commitments of capital to you to match them with. Duration matching is the secret to stability. How much is the originator of these loans changing? Because you looked, for example, at Bank of America this morning, the average FICO score for a car loan is above 800. Most of America does not have a FICO score above 800. So when you're thinking about these asset-based loans and where they're even generated from, where are they coming from? A really good question, because we are seeing, of course, with fintech, broadly defined, but financial innovation. A lot of new channels where these products are being originated very successfully using technology the to support that. Of the world. Absolutely. And in fact, Lending Club has been a partner as the bank market has retreated from providing a lot of this financing. Perfect study. Lending Club has been a partner to Adelaide. Uh, Adelaide has done a billion dollars of financing for Lending Club. Lending Club originates consumer credit but they're not a balance sheet business. So once again, you have the originators or you have people who transact, and then you have to have the people who are really going to hold and manage that risk for the benefit of investors. Mark, your stock has more than doubled since um, 2022. How important is your stock price to you? Very. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, we're very focused on driving our stock price. Kate, the as Shanali mentions, actually, that you're worth now $10 billion more than Carlisle which is a big market cap. It, it, we, we have been very fortunate to be able to position our business in a place where both growth is substantial, private credit, this real estate arena that we're in is very high growth. So that's our highest, gro highest growth business is our real estate business. So we've been able to position in places, markets where there's a lot of growth, and then build a business model that's about durability and predictability. Our business, our revenues are almost all fee-based and our capital is very heavily tipped toward permanent capital. Over 90% of our revenues 
come from permanent capital sources. So I think the stock reflects that we've got a different model. It's higher growth, it's more durable, it's more predictable. We intend to keep it that way. And frankly, businesses like Adelaya and this $7 trillion addressable market give us the tools to go beyond 2025, and a year we've talked a lot about with the marketplace, into the back half of uh, post-2025 uh, and really continue to grow and drive our business and our stock price. Well, great having you on Open Interest. Thank you so much for joining us. Mark Lipschultz there of Blue Owl Capital. Coming up in the next hour, Joanne Feeney, Portfolio Manager at Advisors Capital Management, why she says earnings are more important than the macro now. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>are 30 minutes into the trading day. Welcome to Bloomberg Open Interest. I'm Matt Miller. I'm Shanali Bassett. And I'm Katie Greifeld. And U.S. retail sales, including autos, rose the most in June by the most in three months, suggesting resilient consumer spending at the end of the second quarter. Earnings season ramps up with financials firmly in focus. Bank America trading tops while Morgan Stanley Wealth Unit lags. And Silicon Valley cheers as Trump taps ex-venture capitalist J.D. Vance as his running mate. Former Cisco CEO John Chambers joins us in just a bit. But let's get a check on these markets right now because, again, we have a rally on our hands. The S&P 500 intraday up about three-tenths of a percent. Big tech actually giving up some of its gains. The NASDAQ 100 now just about unchanged on the session. Again, we had been higher no longer. Then you take a look at the bond market, the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield, currently lower by about two basis points, relative calm after what's been a whirlwind couple of weeks for the bond market, Matt. All right, former President Donald Trump filling out his ticket, tapping Ohio Senator J.D. Vance as his running mate. In his first interview after the announcement, Vance identified what he feels is the biggest threat facing the U.S. I think what President Trump has promised to do is go in there, negotiate with the Russians and Ukrainians, bring this thing to a rapid close so that America can focus on the real issue, which is China. That's the biggest threat for our country, and we're completely distracted from it. Let's head to Milwaukee now, the site of this week's convention where we find Bloomberg Balance of Power co-host Kaylee Lines. So, Kaylee, uh, very interesting choice, especially considering we thought Trump was going to go uh, unity for a minute, and then he did a 180. Yeah, I mean, especially after that attempted assassination over this past weekend, there was conversation about whether or not Donald Trump was going to want with his vice presidential selection someone who is more inflammatory in their rhetoric. Is there were bipartisan calls to lower the temperature, tone that rhetoric down, and instead he selected J.D. Vance, who was one of the first to point the finger at President Biden and the left as being part to blame for that attempted assassination over the weekend. So definitely an interesting choice, but the way strategists that I've spoken with uh, in the last 24 hours are viewing it now is actually in this selection, Trump is allowing J.D. Vance to therefore be the pit bull, be the one who can aggressively defend him uh, in the national media throughout the rest of this campaign, while Donald Trump himself may be able to preach more that message of unity and reach out to those independent, undecided voters that he wants to access to secure his victory in November. So that's kind of the balancing act. But of course, J.D. Vance is another white male, so demographically, it may be more difficult to draw um, some voters in that, that he could have otherwise with another selection. But the thinking is, especially in some of those critical swing states, the Rust Belt, Michigan, Pennsylvania, for example, that J.D. Vance may be uh, attracting voters in those states. How much, Kaylee, does money matter at this point? You think about the recent reporting about Mark Andreessen, Ben Horowitz, saying that they plan to donate to a Trump PAC, especially in light of this J.D. Vance announcement as well. How much does that move the needle? Oh, money is everything in a presidential campaign, Shanali, is you need money to be able to conduct it. And J.D. Vance does bring access to that. For all of the talk about J.D. Vance being a populist, which is true, someone who can connect very well to the working class given his upbringing, which is well known to the American public at this point, thanks to the memoir that came out in 2016, Hillbilly Elegy. He also is a venture capitalist. That is what he was doing before he entered the political arena not very long ago. He just, of course, assumed his Senate seat in January of 2023. Prior to that, he was 
was uh, in venture. He was backed by Peter Thiel and others who have been big financial backers to him, and now he can draw that in to this campaign. And I would point out other uh, big names in tech, including Elon Musk, have reacted favorably to the selection of J.D. Vance. And Bloomberg reporting after the Wall Street Journal today that Elon Musk has now committed 40 to, to donating $45 million per month to America PAC, which is a new super PAC that is focusing on supporting Donald Trump by driving turnout, which is going to be everything in this election. And Kaylee, we don't have a lot of time left, Bob, just 30 seconds or so. But of course, you're on the ground in Milwaukee. How did the mood change after we actually got the VP pick in hands? Well, it wasn't all too surprising as J.D. Vance had been understood to be on the short list, but it does feel like it is more jubilant now, especially since Donald Trump was seen in person in public for the first time since that shooting over the weekend, going into the RNC convention with a bandage on his ear, really riling up uh, the crowd. So it does seem the mood is getting more festive, even though overall the tone is more somber and it's much more a message of unity over division, at least to this point. We have many more speeches and days to go. All right, Kaylee Lines, great coverage as always. And stay with Bloomberg TV and radio for more special coverage on the ground in Milwaukee for the Republican National Convention. Watch all week starting at noon Eastern. But for more on the RNC, I'm pleased to say we're joined now by Tobin Marcus. He is Wolf Research Head of Policy and Politics. Tobin, great to have you in the studio with us. So J.D. Vance, as uh, Kaylee told us, maybe not too surprising, but there was that brief moment of unity that we were talking about in the commercial break. What does J.D. Vance add to the Trump ticket? What is the strategy here? I mean, I think this really is not an electability pick. He has assets that they want him to bring to the ticket. You know, I think the geographic appeal in particular seems to be core to the strategy for how the Trump campaign is thinking about using Vance. There's been talk of parking him in Pennsylvania. I think those upper Midwestern so-called blue wall states are really the key to the election. Uh, whether or not that really works is a different question. He did underperform Trump in Ohio uh, when he, or, you know, sort of the Republican margins in Ohio in general uh, in 2022 when he was elected. Um, but first and foremost, I think this is a pick based on loyalty, based on ideological affinity, with an eye past November to the future. I mean, picking him as sort of a future leader of the party is more the play here rather than trying to win in November. We did see um, Sean O'Brien, the Teamsters leader, speaking to the Republican National Convention. A union leader has never addressed the Republican National Convention, right? And it strikes me that, you know, J.D. Vance, with his upbringing and his constant fight for working class, even if it's, you know, the white working class, maybe wants to help turn this party around to um, occupy a space that the Blue Dog Democrats owned when he was a kid. Yeah, certainly we've been seeing that kind of realignment electorally. There's been major, of course, educational realignment. Um, the inroads that Trump has been making in the polling among uh, black and Hispanic voters is concentrated among those you know, younger men, relatively non-ideological voters, voting their pocketbooks. And so I do think that there is an effort to try and double down on that with a kind of populist uh, appeal from, from Vance. You know, I think that his divergences from Republican Party orthodoxy are a little bit overstated. He certainly staked out some positions that are uh, distinct from the pro-business wing of the party on issues like antitrust and financial regulation. He's a conservative. Yeah, right. But generally, he's, you know, he's voted with the party when he's needed to. He has very high scorecards from these conservative groups that are in the business of figuring out sort of how much are these guys on the team. So it's not as if he's, uh, I think, a moderate by, by any real definition. I'm really interested in tying this back to the investor implications here because you saw the Trump trade really take off yesterday. It really moderated to a significant degree today. And you think about the couple of areas that if Trump were to take the presidency with J.D. Vance on his ticket, energy, financials, how much room is there to run? How much are those industries supported in that scenario? Yeah, I mean, we don't think that uh, the, the Trump... Uh, Upside and downside is really going to be that fully priced. We did finally see some big movements today, but to your point, they've come off a little. I think financials and traditional energy certainly look like safe day one winners in the immediate aftermath of a Trump victory. I think the longer term questions around energy, uh, it's not, not totally clear that the economics are there. Financials, I do think, are, uh, are a clearer winner. Um, but, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of outstanding uncertainty, particularly on issues like tariffs, where I think the China risk is certainly not priced yet. So, of course, there's a lot of focus right now on the Republican Party, given that it's RNC week. But the conversation we were having last week was of whether President Biden was actually going to stay in the race. Of course, it feels like some of the air has come out of that conversation after the events of this weekend. But is that a conversation we should still be having? Is that still a possibility? Uh, I think it's certainly a conversation that we should be having. It's a little bit different than the predictive question of whether or not he is going anywhere. You know, I do 
think that the uh, sort of dissipation of momentum around the kind of coalescence against Biden from Democratic members of Congress uh, is really important because there just is not a lot of time left. And always, this has been a question of changing his decision making. It's never been clear what level of pressure would be sufficient to get him to reconsider his own decision, since he's been publicly quite resolute that he's not going anywhere. And you know, at this point, we only really have a couple of weeks left to see any kind of a change. So I I'm not uh, betting on Biden going anywhere at this point. What kind of organization is the DNC? I mean, it seems like they could have won with Biden in 2016 and chose to run Hillary at all costs, right? And now it seems like they're gonna lose this election in 2024 because they're choosing to run Joe Biden at all costs. Yeah, these party organizations really don't have any decision-making authority. The parties are kind of empty husks at this point. We've had a more and more entrepreneurial uh, political system over the course of the last few decades as we've moved away from sort of smoke-filled back rooms, conventions where you actually had the decision be made and uh, sort of move that power to the primaries uh, and to the candidates themselves. So, I mean, we saw a version of this in 2016 when there was, you know, if it had been up to Republican elites at the time, they wouldn't have picked Trump. Um, similarly, now, if it were up to Democratic elites, they would run someone other than Biden. But it must have been a smoke-filled room in 2016. I mean, how else did, you know, Obama and the DNC convince Biden not to run? Well, Hillary had a major inside lane in terms of fundraising, in terms of donor support, in terms of elite support across the party. Biden could have endeavored to challenge her, but it would have been, he would have been a major underdog based on his sort of deficit in, in money, in endorsements and so forth. So I think Obama and uh, a few other people prevailed upon him not to do it. Uh, but, you know, had he chosen to, it still would have been uh, really challenging. Tough to beat Trump. Yeah, I think, think the writing was kind of a wall. Oh, no, I think he would have been. I think he would have done well against Trump, but I don't think he could have gotten through the primary, even if he'd not been I kind see. of tapped to step let's aside. Talk about November for a second here, because you know we've been talking so much about the elite, the donor support here behind these candidates, but what about the voters? Who turns up in November and where? Yeah, I mean, turnout has been a huge question. Uh, even before the uh, sort of crisis around Biden in the wake of the debate, there were a lot of important questions about turnout because Trump's support has always depended really heavily on outperforming among disengaged voters, whereas Democrats have done better again, among voters who reliably turn out. I think, again, that's somewhat of an artifact of, of educational polarization. But that's why we saw such a strong pattern of results for Democrats in 2022 and 2023 that then didn't carry through into this year, even before Biden's more kind of acute weakness. So I think on uh, on that side, on the Trump side, there's a question about do those less engaged voters actually turn out? Does the, you know, the polling uh, inroads he's made among black and Hispanic men do the, that actually show up on Election Day? And then on the Democratic side, you know, obviously you have questions about enthusiasm. Um, the polling is showing a very stark enthusiasm deficit. I tend to think that down the stretch, Trump is a polarizing enough uh, figure for the Democratic base that you'll get enough kind of negative partisanship that people still kind of turn out. But, you know, turnout is going to be down from 2020, uh, I think, unquestionably, since that was the highest turnout election in about 100 years. Uh, and so the question of, you know, where does it drop off most, a lot of that, I think, will be, you know, as important as the persuasion campaign to determine the outcome. Well, that leads nicely to my next question, which is just bluntly, is there any path forward for Biden here? Uh, yeah, I mean, he is a uh, distinctive underdog. There's no question about that. Trump sure looks like a strong favorite at this point. But I think that the, the floor is high enough for essentially any nominee from one of the two major parties, given the state of negative polarization in America today, that you can imagine things breaking in his way. I mean, the, the tone of the conversation among Democrats right now looks a lot like the way that Republicans were talking after the Access Hollywood tape in 2016, where everyone had completely given up on winning. There was sort of a mass flight away from the candidate. Uh, some folks ended up coming home, not because their concerns were laid, but just because that's the one horse you have to bet on. And so you have to uh, hope for the best, even if you're expecting the worst. So I think some combination of a polling error in Biden's favor probably needs to be part of the ingredient at this point. I wouldn't want to bet on that as a prognosticator, but polling errors do happen, um, you know, in, in magnitudes large enough to, to uh, erase the current deficit that Biden's facing. Again, TBD, what happens over the rest of the race, um, you know, along with, again, a sort of more favorable pattern of turnout for Democrats, a uh, successful kind of paid media campaign by the Biden campaign to um, activate swing state voters about uh, the elements of Trump's personality and the Trump agenda that they don't like. I mean, I think it, it is still going to be the case that there are a lot of voters at the end of the day who look at both candidates unfavorably. And those people, I think, are uh, just by virtue of that fact going to be late deciders uh, and to some extent up for grabs, even though Biden is at a deficit. It's a good reminder. We have months left to go. That is our thank you to Tobin Marcus of Wolf Research. Thank you for coming in today. Now let's get a look at the stocks moving this hour. Here's our Abigail Doolittle.
Well, Schnelli, let's take a look at the shares of Bank of America because, as you well know, as our Wall Street correspondent, we have a nice gain here. In fact, the best day of the year for Bank of America, up 3.9 percent. They beat estimates. Importantly, trading was strong as equities really uh, participated and drove those trading results. In addition, relative to the net interest income guide for the fourth quarter, uh, it is stronger than expected, $14.5 billion. So, again, these shares are higher. Let's take a look at our next mover, which I believe is going to be uh, Matt. Match, although I may be surprised. You're so right. once we oh great, so here's another big gainer on the day, up seven percent. And this, of course, a starboard value uh, has in fact taken a stake, a six point six percent stake, the third activist investor this year. And Bloomberg News did see a note from Starboard, a letter from Starboard saying that if the company is not able to turn around its operations, well, they're going to push for a sale. And then finally, I don't know, Shanali, whether or not you're on Amazon as much as the average person. I'm on less than the average person, but I. Might go on today because, of course, today is the first day of the prime event. Investors liking it earlier, the stock up 1%, but still up a healthy six tenths of 1%, especially given the more than 25% gain on the year so far. Indeed, there are boxes outside my door <laughs> as we speak. <laughs> Abigail, thank you so very much. And coming up next, we're going to speak with Joanne Feeney, Advisors Capital Management Portfolio Manager and Partner, sharing her earnings season insights. Of course, we are just getting started here. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Now let's get to high interest, a look at what's making headlines around the world. President Biden labeled J.D. Vance a clone of Donald Trump. The president's remarks were just one part of a full court press deployed by his campaign after Trump's selection was announced. Democrats seek to cast doubt on Vance's independence and populist credentials by painting the venture capitalist turned senator as both subservient to Trump and part of the elite that he so often fights against. After firing tens of thousands of workers, Tesla is steadily adding employees back again. The company is looking to hire nearly 800 new employees. The positions range from AI specialists to more run-of-the-mill service jobs. The pickup in hiring has coincided with Tesla shares going on a tear. And U.S. retail sales, excluding the impact of a cyber attack on auto dealerships, rose in June by the most in three months. This is a sign consumers regained their footing at the end of the second quarter. Total retail sales were unchanged, restrained by a 2% slide in receipts at those auto dealers. The figures are not, however, adjusted for inflation. Katie? All right, let's turn this conversation back to the markets because joining us now is Joanne Feeney. She is Advisors Capital Management Portfolio Manager and Partner. I'm going to go to the first line in your notes because you write that second quarter earnings will show once again that earnings are more important than the macro in a good or a bad way for the bulls, Joanne. Well, uh, Katie, in a good way. Uh, what we see, right, of course, is that Evaluation of a company depends on the earnings that they can uh, deliver uh, now and in the future. And this earnings season, I think, is going to be closely watched, not only for uh, what companies have done for us last quarter, but really what they think the rest of the year is going to be like. And so, therefore, I would put in the backseat what's going on in the macro front. Really there, what I mean is the Federal Reserve and its interest rate policy. You know, there is increasing evidence to support uh, a Fed rate cut coming later this year, maybe two. Um, but ultimately, interest rates can adjust the valuation for a, a whole stream of future earnings for a company. But what we have seen so far is that the market has been driven by higher earnings expectations, higher growth expectations, primarily from some of the tech leadership and the consumer leadership. But we're now starting to see that broaden, and that's a positive environment for equity markets. Joanne, is it a broadening or a rotation? You take a look at today's trade and one day doesn't make a trend, but certainly there's that feeling in the market here. The NASDAQ composite, NASDAQ 100 down on the day, the S&P 500 still barreling towards fresh records. You have also the Dow Jones Industrial Average hitting another high just yesterday. Russell 2000, a lot of love. Do we move on from those high flyers at this point? <laughs> Yeah, Shanali, the um, opportunity here for investors is to take some of the winnings off the table. Imagine how concentrated these funds have become because of the run-up in the tech leaders and in the consumer leaders. And so there's an opportunity here. Take some of those winnings off the table, some of those profits, and invest them in a way to become more diversified in your funds. 
it's been hard to keep up with some of the appreciation we've enjoyed, and our clients have seen that. And we want to make sure from our perspective also, because we in invest in individual stocks, we want to make sure clients remain diversified. And so, yeah, there's certainly some rotation going on because of that concentration that's developed over time. But that's not a bad thing. It does still suggest pretty good strength in equity markets. If you look at the you know, earnings of the S&P 493, um, you might imagine that we have been in a recession, right? Because they haven't grown for the past six quarters. Is that going to change this quarter, and is it going to be sustained? I mean, are we, are we going to see a, a period of growth again for the S&P 500, for the majority of the S&P 500 companies? You know, Matt, that uh, number that you just quoted, the, the lack of earnings in the other 493, really is uh, almost uh, worth parsing a little bit more carefully. Because when you look at the details, you see plenty of growth for earnings among some of those in the other 493 companies in the S&P 500. But you also see companies that have not done well. And so the average doesn't look particularly good. And so that sort of reinforces our approach, which is look for individual companies. Don't look at the indices overall and don't invest that way. You know, if you take in the retail space, we had those great numbers this morning, aside from what's, you know, what's happening in autos, but companies like a, a TJ Maxx, a, a Constellation Brands, or, you know, some of the others in off-price retail, they're doing well because consumers are still desperately trying to economize in their budgets, and so they're shopping there. So you really have to pick and choose among those other 493. Some of them have seen very good growth, and we're now starting to see some recovery in, for example, enterprise spending. We're starting to see some recovery in industrials. But we have to watch out for the risks that are plaguing some of those companies in the consumer space that are really vulnerable to the struggles of the low end and the mid-range consumer where we are seeing weakness. Well, Joanne, I'm so happy you brought up those single names because when we are tracking the consumer, of course, we got a bit more information today in retail sales. Uh, but you think about this trade down that we keep on talking about and you bring up TJX, for example, I have to imagine that fits in pretty neatly. Yeah, exactly. It, we've held it for a long time. We think it, it does two things. One, it, it picks up on, you know, paradoxically, it picks up on benefits when consumers are spending more. Uh, because they just offer such a plethora of opportunity for finding bargains and interesting, you know, interesting objects. But also when mid-range consumers want to save money, they trade down and they go over to TJ Maxx or Home Goods or one of their other stores. And so they also benefit on the cost side because the inventory that they sell, they get from other higher priced retailers at very cut rates. And so their inventory of relatively inexpensive products to sell improves when the economy actually struggles. So it's a, it's a good opportunity, plus they pay a little bit of a dividend. We like to build in some income for our clients so that they can know that the income is coming in even when their stock prices may go down during a downturn. All right, Joanne, it's always great to speak with you. Appreciate your time this morning. Our thanks to Joanne Feeney of Advisors Capital Management. Now coming up, we'll take a look at the companies making the most social buzz today. Social Climbers, up next. This is Bloomberg. All right, it's time now for Social Climbers. And first up, Disney investigating a reported hack of its internal Slack workplace messages. It said that some of the material that was leaked included talks on maintaining Disney's website, job candidate assessments, and photos of employees' dogs. Let's also talk about Philip Morris, the cigarette company, expanding its production of Zen, of course, uh, investing more heavily in that. Uh, coming up on Bloomberg, we have John Chambers. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. A string of Silicon Valley titans putting their money behind Donald Trump. Elon Musk, Palantir's Joe Lonsdale, and crypto billionaires Cameron and Tyler Winklevoss are donating to a pro-Trump pack. And now the information reports Mark Andreessen and Ben Horowitz are following suit. And for the first time, they have not previously supported the former president. Joining us now to talk about all this and more is John Chambers, former chairman and CEO of Cisco. He is now CEO of JC2 Ventures, a VC firm in Palo Alto, 
probably pretty close to where all those other gentlemen uh, are sitting. John, it's great to have you on the program. We're starting to see your uh, VC colleagues kind of fall in line, and I'm wondering why now? Why do you think we see the likes of Andreessen and Horowitz donating to Trump where they haven't supported him before? Well, I think what you're seeing is that uh, many of my colleagues in Silicon Valley are focused about the future of technology being influenced dramatically uh, by the uh, president's direction. And you're seeing more and more of Silicon Valley leaders very comfortable with the direction that uh, prior President Trump will take the country in terms of the economy and technology and candidly in terms of business friendliness, job creation and innovation. But I think the major thing that no one's talking about yet, and you kind of alluded to it, Matt, in your question, is that the economy will be driven by AI for the next decade. And uh, Katie, this is what we talked about back in October at the last time I interviewed with you all. Uh, AI will drive productivity. Your prior guest said earnings is what it's all about. Well, AI will drive earnings dramatically of companies across all industries over this next decade. And if you think about startups uh, and an innovation environment, the U.S. has probably never been more aggressive in terms of leadership and technology over the last 10 years, Canley pulling away from Europe and pulling away uh, from China, who actually was in the lead five or six years ago. I got to ask you about, well, the great state of Ohio, John, I'm from Columbus. You were born in Cle Cleveland. J.D. Vance is from near, you know, Middletown's near Cincinnati. Um, what do you think about, you know, we refer to him as a former venture capitalist, even though at 38 he's been, you know, a Marine, a law student, a lawyer, a senator, so he's done a lot, but he's been hanging out around Silicon Valley. Um, he seems to be supportive of some of the left's pushes, Lena Khan um, and Elizabeth Warren. On the other hand, he is fully behind Donald Trump. Is he good for big tech? Is he good for venture capital? I think he is a very good vice president pick for President Trump. Uh, he is from Ohio, as you said, both of us uh, live there and were born there. I'm from West Virginia is where I was raised. And I think what you see is that part of the country understanding they have to reinvent themselves and have to innovate and make it inclusive across their country, uh, across their states. So I think if you look at really the future of America, uh, you're looking about how some of the states that have not been uh, is inclusive in the growth over the last decade become, candidly, a, a great place to work, a great place to do startups and grow. My home state of West Virginia used to be ranked in the bottom 10 states in every category from economic growth to standard of living to attracting businesses. Now they're in the top 10 in most categories. And it was a conscious effort by both Republicans and Democrats to change the state at a senatorial level with Joe Manchin and uh, Shelley Moore Capito, at the governor level with Governor Justice, at the uh, Senate and the House level, redoing the universities. And we attracted $6 billion investments into our state in the last two and a half years. We normally, uh, Matt, wouldn't get a billion dollar investment except every maybe 10 to 20 years. So it speaks to states wanting to control their, their future and it speaks to innovation. I've never been more optimistic about what tech will do for this country and our ability to lead as a country and can we partner with countries like India in a very constructive way. You know, we were talking a little earlier in the commercial break about this prediction you had that M&A would be robust once again, and then you saw that uh, deal news, this idea of a potential $23, a $23 billion sale to Google by Wiz, and you wonder what this would mean in a potential Trump administration moving forward. You've had J.D. Vance really say that Lena Khan has been one of the few people in the Biden administration who is doing a pretty good job. Do you think that a Trump-Vance tip Ticket would still mean more clamping down on big ticket deals. Well, there's probably uh, uh, three questions there. The first one is Do I think MA activity is going to increase? Yes. And going back, Katie, to our discussion in October, I said the first thing you watch is the stock market. Stock market at that time was going well. We discussed that I thought it was going to do very well as we move forward over the next year. Second thing you watch is MA activity. 
And remember how quiet it had been. For VCs, there are very few exits that have occurred over the last, uh, uh, in Canada, it was the slowest time in 10 years this last year. I was fortunate enough to have two companies get bought, one by AMD and one by Cox Communications, and then more recently one in the defense industry group, and then rubrics went public. I think you're going to see M&A activity accelerate. And you're going to see large companies, both tech companies and non-tech companies, acquire startups to help kickstart their AI engine. Mm. Every company, regardless of industry, is going to go AI. So I like what we see in terms of M&A. Uh, it used to be the exception with WhatsApp, a $16 billion acquisition a decade ago. Then OpenAI with what an $83 billion evaluation with what Microsoft did. Then your comment about what Google's done with a $23 billion evaluation. I think the sweet spot for your listeners is Decacorns are going to come back in vogue. Mm -hmm. A $10 billion to $100 billion evaluation, which there are only 43 companies in that range today in tech in the U.S., I think will get to be 100 by the end of this decade. So that's where you really create the jobs. But what you're seeing is these companies I just mentioned having 50 to 1,000 employees. Right. Uh, so you're going to see a birth of a new group of decacorns, and I think that ter terminology will be back in vogue. Well, John, of course, that's the M&A piece. I want to talk about IPOs because you think about the conversation we had back in October talking about sort of the dearth of IPOs, and that continues today. You think about what you're doing over at JC2 Ventures, basically coaching startups. I know that you have about three startups that have IPO'd, but why aren't we seeing more of these startups actually go public? Well, I think it has to occur. Either the markets are wrong with the direction and M&A activity uh, increasing, uh, or we're about to see a leveling off. I'm pretty optimistic on the markets for this next year. So as stocks go up, the IPO market has to kick into gear. But uh, Katie, as I will always do, I, I want to be very candid. It's very sluggish right now. The M&A activity unsolicited is up dramatically, I think, in the VC world. We're seeing that. VCs are starting to invest more. But I think you're probably at least a quarter or two away before you begin to see the IPO market uh, begin to tick up. Yeah, I, I, I say I was giving a, a talk over the weekend with Jesse Draper, who runs a, a, a VC fund, Halogen. And some of the VCs in the room mentioned that all of the air has been taken out by these big mega cap stocks, right? Why invest in a little fledgling company, um, you know, in terms of an IPO when you have the, uh, the magnificent seven? Plus, you know, Shanali is always talking to these people in private uh, credit who seem to be offering alternatives to companies so that they don't have to go public as soon as they had to in the past. Do you think there's a a structural shift here? No, I don't for the long term, Matt. And uh, I like the question. You've set me up in a very good way. Uh, I think M&A activity uh, always increases before the IPO market. Uh, if you really look, uh, I think a number of companies are getting set up for the IPO market uh, on it. And I think you'll see it play out as before, exactly what we talked about last October. Stock market goes up, M&A activity, VCs free up a little bit more. Uh, you begin to fuse some IPOs, VCs bet more. But right now, the money going into AI startups are huge, and I think you're going to see a very active IPO market in the next year if I were betting. Well, let's talk about some of that money. Uh, you wrote recently that 38% of venture capital in the U.S. in the first quarter went into AI stocks. John, I have to say I'm a little bit surprised that it was only 38 percent. You think about how much we talk about AI. I mean, if it's not AI, where is that money going? Well, to your point, that was a surprise to me, too. I think if we watch the second quarter and third quarter, you'll see it move past the 50 percent level. Uh, for VCs that invest in AI-based companies, they pay a 50 percent premium versus the same business model in terms of economic and financial growth. Uh, for a company that's in software as a service or fintech on it. I think, using my portfolio as an example, I used to have six AI companies when I bet on AI seven years ago. I have nine unicorns out of those 20 companies already, been very, very fortunate on it, but all of them will be AI-based. So I think you will see any company, regardless of size, who does not have a good AI strategy, implementation and differentiation will get left behind. That's what you're seeing fueling these uh, strategic acquisitions, both by tech companies and non-tech, which I think will accelerate on it. So that's a very nice way of saying 
I think every company will eventually become an AI company, whether you're in manufacturing, automotive, startup, big company, traditional company. Those countries that lead in AI will lead in economic growth. I think it will power the stock market for this next decade. Mm -hmm. It's a nice way of saying I wouldn't invest in a company that doesn't have a good AI strategy. You know, John, something Matt and I were talking about earlier is why do so many tech titans step up to support J.D. Vance when he also wants to or has said previously uh, break up Google and has been so hard on big tech? I'm wondering if there's something that is more indicative of this feeling. You mentioned Decacorns a little earlier. Do people just want more options here besides the MAG7, these massive stocks that uh, have become really monolithic in some ways? Well, first, I think those companies have done a great job of driving our market uh, and can lead the U.S. leadership. But to your point, uh, people want competition. They want to make sure the large companies don't move, misuse their economic power. And uh, we also want that uh, startup and stock market success to be spread across all 50 states, not just resident primarily in a, a California, a New York, or a Texas type of approach. Uh, I think making sure the environment is a level playing field for the smaller companies in startups is a must, in my opinion. So I would uh, look at that very aggressively going forward. I think that's healthy. Uh, uh, we've lost a little bit of the confidence and the trust of the American people with the Internet and Cisco. 92 percent of Americans believed in the 90s that technology was good for the country and very good for them personally. Now, as you all know, that's below 50. I think we've re got to regain the confidence of the average person in America that it will benefit them for the future. But make no mistake about it. AI is here to stay. Every one of you will use AI in a major way in the next two to three years in ways that you hadn't dream before, and every company will incorporate it as well. So if I were an investor, I'd do a portfolio of AI companies. Are there going to be some spectacular train wrecks? Absolutely, Katie, going to happen. Uh, but the benefit of the large group, I think they will outperform the general market. And as I said before, I'd look at that Decacorn type category as perhaps being one of the most exciting, the 10 to 100 billion type of range. John, great to get some time with you. Thank you so much for speaking with us. John Chamber there of JC2 Ventures, and we wish the Mountaineers uh, a good season this fall as well. Let's get a check on the markets right now. For that, we go to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abby? It's interesting, Matt. Right now, we're seeing a small split in the markets. We have the S&P 500 up for a 13th out of the last 15 days. The Nasdaq 100, though, down ever so slightly off of its lows at the lows, down closer to three-tenths of 1%. Let's see which side wins. We'll be taking a look at uh, why the Nasdaq 100 is down in a moment. But first, let's take a look at commodities because we have crude oil down uh, for a third day in a row and copper is also down. A very interesting article on the Bloomberg terminal talking about how one entity out of China has really stopped buying copper, is now buying aluminum. So when we put this together with the S&P 500, in orange we're looking at oil, in yellow we're looking, or excuse me, orange is copper, uh, yellow is oil, and then white is the S&P 500. And you can see that they are all mainly trending higher. However, copper's really come off of its peak in a big, big way. In fact, Carly Garner of DeCarlyTrading.com thinks that it could go 20 to 30 percent lower. It may not, but even if not, there is a possibility that this, she says, is a tell on the S&P 500 going lower, perhaps some sort of an economic tell, or maybe, I hate to bring this word up, but deflation, disinflation. So stay tuned. This chart's an interesting uh, one for sure if that divergence builds. And then finally, in terms of some of the stocks that we have moving on the day, dragging on the Nasdaq 100, while we do have United Health and the banks trading higher, take a look at the tech trade. We've got some serious weakness here, whether this has to do with some of what you all were just talking about with J.D. Vance and uh, the former president and possibly an anti-tech uh, stance. We don't know, but we do certainly have a big cooling for some of these big tech names on the day, Katie. Yeah, a lot of your mega cap tech down on the day. Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle, thank you so much. Now coming up, we hear from Steve Ratner of Willett Advisors as markets analyze the potential implications of Trump's policies. This is Bloomberg.
time now for our daily Wall Street Week conversation. And with nearly four months to go until the presidential election, former President Donald Trump's bid for a second term is gaining momentum. Wall Street Week host David Weston asked Steve Ratner how investors are reacting to the growing odds of a Trump victory. Steve Ratner is the chairman and CEO of Willett Advisors, which invests Michael Bloomberg's personal and philanthropic assets. There's a number of different things going on in the market at the moment. There are a lot of cross currents and so forth. But if we want to just focus on the Trump trade, his probability of success is now up to close to 70 percent. And that has made the market wake up and say, OK, so what are we looking at? And so it really spans a huge gamut of things, everything from gun manufacturers to for profit education, which thinks they're going to benefit if he stops the student loan forgiveness to the GSEs, Fannie and Freddie, because maybe he won't uh, he'll, he won't take the dividend sweep anymore. Uh, energy stocks, uh, manufacturing companies that might benefit from the tariffs. And so investors are rushing around looking for all the different places they think they would benefit from another Trump presidency. One of the things I think we've seen is in the bond curve, basically, uh, for Treasuries, because there's a sense that actually there's going to be higher rates out there in the long end of the curve, which changes a fair number of things. What is the possibility of a Trump presidency with his economic policies leading to more inflation, therefore the Fed may be having to raise rates again? Well, the bond trade's a little complicated because we did have that good in the sense of being slightly soft jobs number, and the predicted number of Fed rate cuts is now up to something over two, and therefore the 10 years started to come down, and now you have the Trump piece layering on that, pushing it up a little bit, but not hugely. But I don't think there's a lot of doubt that his fiscal policies as expressed would be, uh, would be inflationary and therefore biased toward higher interest rates. He's talking about extending his ta TCJ, the Tax Cut uh, and Jobs Act, which is something around a $4 trillion cost. He talks about offsets, but frankly, no president of either party has been very good about offsetting tax cuts in several decades, really going back to uh, the end of the Clinton term. And so uh, the result is that it does make the market nervous about what could happen to interest rates. And I don't think interest rates are going to get raised. The question is, do they come down as fast as we were hoping they might come down? So, so talk about that uh, Tax Cut and Jobs Act specifically. We had Scott Besson on last week. And he said, oh, no, don't worry about it. We're going to save a lot of money. We're going to save a trillion dollars a year uh, from the basically uh, undoing the Inflation Reduction Act. We're going to save another trillion by redoing Medicare. Uh, now, I will note that when President Trump came in the first time, he said they were going to get rid of Obamacare. That would save a slew of money. But what are the prospects that they actually would cut back on some of the spending under the Biden administration? Well, remember that we didn't get rid of Obamacare because John McCain. And because while he had technically had control of both houses of Congress, he lost a Republican that cost him uh, that. So a lot of this is going to depend on what happens to Congress. If both houses of Congress go Republican, then he's obviously got much more scope to do a bunch of stuff. Whether he really would do it or not, who knows. Uh, he's proven in this campaign to be, I think, a little craftier than in the past in terms of the way he's talking about things like abortion. I know it's not a spending issue, but he's trying to not be so quite the Project 2025 stuff. He's trying to be not so far out to the right. So we don't really know exactly how he'll govern. The record of the first Trump presidency was not good from a fiscal point of view. The deficit went up by hundreds of billions of dollars before COVID ever arrived, in large part because the TCJA never came close to paying for itself. It was close to a $2 trillion cost with no offsets in spending and no real revenues associated with it. So that's all on the tax, the revenue side, as it were. What about tariffs? The one thing President Trump has always seemed to enjoy is imposing tariffs, particularly on China, but not only on China, frankly. He likes tariffs. That does, of course, increase the cost to consumers and therefore, I guess, inflation. Sure. And by the way, his last set of tariffs, which were far less robust than what he's talking about now, raised something like $30 billion of revenue. I thought you were going to ask about revenue. Very little contribution to revenue. Uh, the evidence is overwhelming. Uh, many economists have studied this, that essentially 100 percent, 95, 105 percent, something in that ballpark was paid for by consumers. None of it was paid for by China. Maybe a little of it came out of the companies in terms of profit margins, but essentially it was paid for by consumers and was therefore inflationary. Now, they were very limited tariffs. If you start talking about 10 percent across the board on all imports, you're in a different ballgame. When we talk about inflation, one of the things we naturally think about is the Federal Reserve. It's their job, actually, to have price stability, right? Uh, there's a lot of speculation, not necessarily coming from Donald Trump himself. It's from people around him, uh, like Peter Navarro. He's talked about firing Jay Powell. But what are the prospects of really undermining, to some extent, the independence of the Fed? That's, to me, incredibly scary. Uh, I think the independence of the Fed 
they don't get everything right. They got inflation wrong, we'll stipulate to that. They got some stuff wrong in 2019. They may have gotten some stuff wrong coming out of the GFC, although they did a great job generally in the GFC. But let's just stipulate the independence of the Fed is critical and central to our economic success. And there's no ifs, ands, or buts about that. You would not want the Congress or the White House in charge of monetary policy. And so any step to undermine the Fed by any president of either party should be something that we all push back as strongly as possible. And that was Steve Radner of Willett Advisors with Bloomberg's David Weston. Now tomorrow we will hear from former Fed Governor Dan Tarullo about how changes in Washington will affect banking. This is Bloomberg. Let's get to your trading diary. This is what you need to be watching this week. Bloomberg continues our special coverage on the ground in Milwaukee of the Republican National Convention. And we're gonna hear from Fed Governor Adriana Kugler this afternoon. Tomorrow, we get a look inside the Fed's beige book. We will also get U.S. mortgage applications and on Thursday, the all-important European Central Bank decision. All right, a lot to look forward to there. I will note, you take a look at markets right now, gold jumping to a record high, so a record high for uh, physical Bitcoin, the S&P 500, <laughs> on its way there as well. Now, coming up, we have Bloomberg Technology, but that does it for open interest. This is Bloomberg.